All right, gang, sitting here with my father-in-law, Jim Albers, who uh, had a career at NASA that was really, really interesting, fascinating. So, Jim, you worked for NASA from 1963 to 1997. And so what were your, what were your different titles through that time? Okay, in 1963, I uh, took my initial job at uh, Lewis Research Center, which is now called John Glenn Research Center after the astronaut John Glenn had changed its name. And uh, so the first uh, years from 63 through 68, I worked in space power systems as an engineer. And that's where I did a few, some zero gravity maneuvers, but we'll talk about that more when we talk about some of the stories. And then from 68 to 1975, I was transferred to the Vertical Short Takeoff and Landing Division, where we worked on V-stall aircraft and did a lot of full-scale wind tunnel tests of different components, in fact, full-scale V-stall aircraft. And in 1975, I had the opportunity to transfer to Dryden Flight Research Facility at Edwards Air Force Base. And they did high performance research aircraft. So my first job was head of space power systems at the Dryden Flight Research Facility, where I had two SR 71s, actually YF 12A, which is a prototype of the SR 71. And we used those as test beds. And then while I was at Dryden, after we finished that program around 1978 or so, we had a secret symposium, which I was chairman of. Uh, I went on to actually be deputy director of aeronautical projects at Dryden, responsible for all aeronautical flight testing at Edwards Air Force Base. And then in 1980, I took a year off from Dryden. I was transferred to NASA headquarters. 1980-1981 as a project manager the first six months in, in the Office of Aeronautics and Space Technology where we answered uh, requests from Congress in terms of different questions regarding NASA programs. And after six months there, as part of my training, they transferred me to Space Shuttle Operations as a program manager. And in both cases, I was working directly for an associate administrator for those two major areas for the NASA as an agency. And then from there, I went back to Dryden Flight Research Center, again being uh, deputy director of aeronautical projects for the Dryden Research Center. And then in 1982, I had an opportunity to go to NASA Ames uh, and my job there initially was after I had an SES senior executive training at NASA headquarters, they transferred me to Ames to be deputy director of aeronautics and flight systems. That was uh, essentially the aeronautics directorate at Ames Research Center. In 19, that was from 82 to 85. In 1985, we had a major reorganization at Ames Research Center. And then I became uh, deputy director of a new organization called Aerospace Systems. And so besides just aeronautical programs, we also had all the human factors research and information systems, plus much of the aeronautical activity. So it was kind of a broader aeronautics directorate, including space systems. And then in 19, let's see, I was there from uh, 1980, let's see, I got to think about this, uh, at Ames Research Center from uh, well, look at 1980, from, huh? Yeah, 82 to 85. Yeah, 82, uh, 82 to in flight 85, systems. 85 was a reorganization, so I stayed at Deputy Director of Aerospace Systems until actually 1994, and then in 94, uh, they changed me to a position of just Associate Director of Aeronautics until 97, until I retired. So that's kind of a, a history of the different positions I had. Okay. Three to 75 Over. or anything that you can do. Yeah, I know when you I have started a bunch. in 1963 at John Glenn, or was Lewis Research Center at the time, I was in space power systems developing, at that time we were developing a space power systems for space station where a space station wasn't developed, you know, for another 20 years, but we were way ahead from a standpoint of technology. And so we were developing this 
system called SNAP-8, Space Nuclear Auxiliary Power System, like 35,000 watts uh, that was supposed to operate in space to support space station. But one of the issues that we had to address in that development was to look at, at the difference between 1G and 0G in some of the fluid dynamic loops. You know, it was a ranking power system cycle that had to operate with no gravity. So one of the things that I was asked to do, and I was in my early 20s at the time, I started at 21, so around 22, 23 years old, they were looking for volunteers to go out and do zero gravity maneuvers over Lake Erie in a restricted <laughs> airspace where not only if you had to bail out, you had to have a inflate a raft and you had a bright orange suit on in, in order if you had to bail out. So they gave us a safety review and stuff. I didn't have to do bailing out for practice, but we had to go through a review to, there was a pilot, co-pilot and two engineers and we were taking pressure readings of this uh, actually mercury boiling at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit in a bomb bay of an AJ-2 aircraft. This is a twin engine aircraft turboprop with a jet engine and fuselage. And what we would do, we'd go up to 40,000 feet. The pilot would go into a dive and then pull back on the stick as hard as he could, get a parabolic trajectory and we could get plus or minus uh, 05 Gs for two minutes, which was more than adequate to look at the difference between one and zero G of this fluid flowing through these condenser tubes of this power system components, the major component. We were just looking at the one component. I would do that for almost eight hours of zero gravity maneuvers, one wow. right after the other. You go, and the problem was a lot of engineers would get sick. They gave us Dramamine if you want. I took Dramamine for the first few days. Uh, and then after that, I didn't need it because we did a lot of, I did a lot of stunt flying with other pilots when I was uh, air, studying aeronautical engineering at St. Louis University. So to me, I was kind of used to doing not zero gravity maneuvers, but some stance with aircraft, so it never bothered me too much. Anyway, we were doing this, and what the problem was when you, that why people got sick, it wasn't the zero G that bothered them, it's the change in G load as you go from one G to, you know, like two Gs and then zero G, you know what I'm saying? You, the, the change in yeah. G maneuvers is what made people sick. They told you, obviously, don't eat a lot of food before you do these <laughs> tests and stuff. And so that was the major problem. Anyway, I could tell you some, some stories when after about the third flight, one time we were strapped down to the bomb bay. You know, the bomb bay was open with this mercury vapor. This is, a, this is a, a, an old uh, retired Navy bomber, yeah, correct? Yeah, so, so the pilot and co-pilot was up front in the cockpit, and he, we had a door in between us there, but we could talk to them. We all had headsets where we could talk to each other. But one day I forgot to hook my parachute down. It's supposed to be hooked down to the bomb bay. I left it there. And so the first time we went out into maneuver, this parachute dropped up, popped up, would hit the ceiling because it floated, right? Anything that wasn't that floating, came down and hit me in the head. And it kind of almost kind of blacked out for a minute. And they said, Jim, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, oh, I, tell you, I forgot to hook my parachute. Anyway, the other engineer said, boy, you better not forget that again. <laughs> anyway, that was a you know, learning experience. It was like the third flight or so. And that was kind of interesting. Anyway, after we were doing this for like six months, there were two different pilots. One pilot was more gentle as he pulled back on the stick and he didn't get quite as much zero G, but this one pilot just loved to pull as hard as he could back on the stick and get as much zero G as he could. And after doing that for about six hours, when we came out of a maneuver, all of a sudden we heard a big explosion. And what happened is a piece of the compressor or the jet engine or something came loose and the pilot said, get ready to bail out. And I said, holy <laughs> man, I, did, I didn't want to, not want to bail out. So anyway, we hobbled in to Cleveland Hopkins Airport and the fire trucks came over there and everything. And the engine did not start fire though. And you know, everything was fine, but it was really scary because I thought for sure I had to jump in Lake Erie. Oh wow. It was really an experience. Anyway, the, the engine replacement 
would have been 400,000, but since we had 90% of the data, they said, well, we're good to go, we're not going to replace the engine, because NASA at the time did not have the money to replace the engine, and we thought we had enough data to look at, you know, the, the difference between 1G and 0G. But that was one of the most enjoyable early experiences that I had as a young engineer to be able to have the opportunity to fly into it. Okay, Jim, so in closing, where do you see, you know, NASA going from here, aviation, um, you know, uh, unmanned vehicles, that whole thing uh, going forward? Okay, well, my view has changed over the years a little bit. Uh, I think manned space flight is still an important element, but I think uh, we should, at least near term, should be a, a greater emphasis on unmanned vehicles. Do that first. But I think our future should be, from NASA perspective, is to let the industry now be the leader, like SpaceX, where we could do much cheaper than what we did for space shuttle operations in those days. Let industry lead some of the large rocket technology and let us do the more higher risk stuff related to aerospace systems like unmanned systems to Mars and uh, ex ex you know more ex expanding the universe in terms of different types of of testing that we can do with unmanned vehicles, which are which is very high research, and let the more automatic uh, large space rocket systems being led by industry. That's that's my personal view today. But I still think it's important that we need um, a major goal, like going going establishing a colony on a moon might be the first step in getting more experience with zero gravity and the effects on the human body before we actually go to Mars. And once that is established, then by that time, I think we would have the capability to be able to, to go to Mars and back. But the major challenge from going to Mars is really the human body response to zero gravity, which we haven't totally solved that issue, you know, without degrading effects on bone, bone mass and other things. So if we can get more experience at that, maybe setting up a colony on the moon where people would stay for even more than a year uh, and solve that issue, at the same time continue developing systems that could get us to Mars and back, I think is where the future would be for, from, um, from the space side of the house. As far as aeronautics, I think we've come a long way in terms of uh, doing research for future aircraft technology. And a lot of the civil aircraft technology is applicable to the military, you know, military high performance vehicles. And I think Dryden Flight Research Facility will continue to lead in terms of future research for advanced, say, fighter technology, which they have. Uh, and I think that's appropriate for us to continue that activity. Well, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> okay, there you go.